Hi, and welcome back to WBC Cares UK In Your Corner podcast. As you see, we've got Scott Welch, chairman of WBC Cares UK and former British and Commonwealth champion. Scott, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. Excellent. And then today we've got Bradley. He's former British Commonwealth and WBO European champion. Cheers, Conte. All right, thanks for having me. So kicking off today, um, I want to talk a bit about sort of like boxing pass. What got you into boxing? How did you get there? Did it naturally just happen or? Yeah, I, um, I was about seven, eight, and my dad worked for Sid Khan, or he still does now. He works for Sid Khan, who runs Elsewood Amateur Boxing Club. And he's got two boys, um, a bit older than me, but they I knew Sid, they used to go to the, to the boxing gym. So I used to go sometimes to work with my dad on the weekends and they would always be going on a Sunday morning to the, to the gym. And, my mum would never let me go, but finally, when I was about seven, eight, she finally let me go, and it just all started from there, really. I didn't look back. Yeah. Once I was in, I was in. So did you kind of, was it hard to get into it, or was it kind of family kind of driven? Yeah, it was, it was my dad, well, my dad coaches now, but he just used to take me, so he never, he never boxed or anything. He, he just, like I say, he worked for Sid, and Sid had, had the gym, so, um, but yeah, he got into coaching, and yeah, I just like I say, once I once I got my foot in the door, I, di I didn't look back. Yeah, was he was he coaching at the time? No, no. no so no. He, so he didn't box, didn't coach. No, he just kind yeah. of he just, naturally just fell into yeah. going into it. Yeah. And then sort of um, with your kind of fitness levels and kind of going into sort of like, did you do skills first or was there skills back then? Back then they didn't have um, skills. They they just could they probably did like these called gym shows sort of thing, but yeah. I didn't I didn't have many. I didn't have yeah. them. Because you do on gym shows as well. Well, as an amateur. No, because you started late, didn't you? Yeah, 19 I was. Yeah. yeah. So a bit of a difference. Yeah. Yeah. A bit of a different <laughs> start, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't do any gym shows. I just used to go. I remember going to the shows all the time and just, I always used to go like as a spare, they'd call it a spare, and just you'd weigh in and get a meal ticket. And nine times out of 10, I'd just think, oh yeah, I'm getting a, like, a meal ticket sort food. of thing. But then, yeah, finally got, got about and then, Were yeah. you still in the same gym that I went to? The, the one in Hackney, is it? Is it? No, in Wandsworth. Wandsworth, yeah, yeah Wandsworth, yeah. sorry, same. yeah, Wandsworth. So yeah. did you go to the same gyms then? I went, no, I went along to Arsfield a few times. So in basically yeah. kids down there in Spa. On Garrett Lane, yeah. yeah. Right, so, so when did you two met each other, sort of like, before yeah, you got yeah, there? Yeah, uh, we go back. <laughs> yeah. <in> yeah. <laughs> the first time, the first time we, um, we we fought. I had Lloyd Ellett fight. Um, I had on there. Okay. Was that in a championship? In championship. Yeah, it yeah. was a championship. Yeah. yeah. Who won? Well, we could, we, come <laughs> second, we come second on that one. There was a bit. There was a bit of shouting going on there from. Uh, <laughs> Scott from and Sid go back too. Yeah, yeah. Me and Sid were nearly rolling on the floor. So. What during our championships? Yeah, very funny. Very so, funny. who you won? Yeah. Close. It was a good fight. Yeah, do you know what I mean, good Lloyd, fight, Lloyd's a good, so. good boy. Me yeah. and Lloyd go back too because we yeah. ended up obviously boxing at the same pro gym together. Yeah. So and we become good friends. So yeah, it was, that's Fantastic. what boxing that's does. Right. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Did you did you meet Lloyd before championships? Then no, I knew room? I knew it. I knew so that was kind of your first introduction to Brian and Hove. Yeah, I knew who so he was. Obviously, you look and yeah. see who's in the championship, who you could meet, and that. And yeah. I, I knew of Lloyd, but. Yeah, obviously we got through. Was that the point you turned over, or kind of? No, no, no? we were still young then. Still, still young. Yeah. How, how old were you then? Uh, what was that in? I can't remember. If it was during ABs or NABCs or something like that. Must have yeah. been. Yeah. Seventeen, eighteen, probably. Yeah, still, yeah, yeah, I reckon. So a few. How many years ago is that? Four. You do the maths. I'm thirty-five now. <laughs> right. So <laughs> fifteen years. Good ago, fifteen so. years. Yeah. Easy fifteen. So you were you were coaching then. You oh, coaching really, all that time. I think I was twelve then. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so when when did you turn over? Uh, I turned pro when I was twenty three. Yeah, yeah. So I'd uh, my thing. I I done well as an amateur. Went. I got to three. Always lost in the final. Got to three schoolboy finals. That was that was my thing. I wanted to win the badge, the Union Jack badge, like yeah. schoolboy champion. But um, yeah, I got to to three finals. Um, Done the junior ABAs and things like that. Box, box for England. Got on the GB team and I've done, done really well as an amateur. And then the, the main thing, like for me, I wanted, I wanted to win the ABAs, like the senior ABAs. Um, I got to the final and lost 
And then I said, right, I'm going to have one more crack at it. And then I lost to a good kid in, in the London finals, Dudley of Shaunsey, who then went on to win it. So then uh, I spoke to Sid and I said, Sid, uh, like, I think it's time to go pro now. And then Sid, Sid gave me his blessing. He said, you've done, you've done everything. Yeah. You've, you've do you, do you think it. your style was maybe more suited for... Pros and um, amateurs, or do you think it was just kind of? I had a good. I just at that at the time I was an amateur, it was computer scoring, so it was like hit and don't get hit sort of thing. So where well, I was yeah. always tall and rangy, I had a good style for the amateurs and You're massive. For yeah, your weight, right? big for the weight. Yeah, always big for the weight. But uh, probably turning over, probably people probably would criticize me and thought I didn't wasn't going to be a good pro because I had big like amateur style, yeah. tall, rangy, but. Yeah, developed well and obviously went on to achieve good things as a pro too. Oh well, yeah, fantastic achievements. So sort of, um, what what would you say, sort of like, do you think that you wish you'd done that in the amateurs, kind of? Or did you close it at that point and think, I need to move on? Yeah, like I say, I was happy. I'd travelled the world with, with England and GB, yeah. boxing some good tournaments and, and picked up that experience there. The main thing, obviously, was the Olympics. I was on the GB team, but um, didn't didn't go to the Olympics or anything like that. That was that was like that's the pinnacle of amateur boxing yeah. is the Olympics. But once that Olympic cycle went, I wasn't waiting another four years to 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 try and get on the yeah. Olympic team. So because you missed out uh, on the uh, team, uh, GB, didn't you? Um, or was it team, around then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I, I won the ABAs in '92, and I come through in that year, so I hadn't really done much before then. And the kid who went to the um, he went to the Olympics, he would already been on the England squad and everything. Do you feel before. like you'd wanted to have done that? Yeah, it would have been fantastic. I mean, the year, the year, as I say, the year that I won, won that we were due to uh, fight in the Acropolis Cup and England sent out a team and then we literally, I was out there and they dropped, I think, three or four weights. So they didn't fight, so I never actually got to fight. So um, I was out there in Greece and with, with the England squad, so that was... Yeah. Pretty fantastic. I mean, 23 is probably the age where you're starting to think that you're a bit old in the amateurs then, aren't yeah. you? The same as me. I, I turned pro just just before my 24th birthday. So, yeah. you know, thinking I was, it's, it's a bit long in the tooth now to be in the amateurs at that age. But I think now they're staying a lot older, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. Staying in the amateurs a lot longer now. Because you had a relatively short amateur career. <clears throat> yeah, four years amateur. Yeah. How many yeah. fights? Um, 30, 38, 38 amateurs. 38, yeah. So you were around the amateurs at the age of seven? Yeah, I, I started at seven, but I think my first, like, proper competitive fight was 10 or 11, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. So how many, how many amateurs did you have? I went on to have 94 amateurs. 94? Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, don't Good mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to get to 100, <laughs> but yeah. I was done. That's yeah, right. there you go, call <laughs> it a day at some point. Yeah. And then you got to save some for the pros as well. Of course, yeah. And, uh, the, you sort of like through your pro career, what do you think sort of like greatest achievements? Obviously winning the British Commonwealth and yeah. WBO European. Yeah. Sort of like which one do you think was your The British title was the, the main that was like or even when I was an amateur, you used to look at the pros and see the British title. That's I believe the best part in boxing. And I always said that I wanted to be British champion, but not just win it, I wanted to win it outright. And that was my my like, so did boy, you... dream. I went on and done that. Yeah, I, won it and then you got to successfully defend it three times. Yeah. You get to keep it outright and I went on to do that. So yeah, that was a big tick off the box for me. Yeah, that's a massive achievement. So well done on that. That's Thank great. You. Yeah. So then when you obviously reached British, did you have to rethink sort of like obviously you've achieved yeah. what you wanted? Yeah. Did you then kind of have to rethink and go, right, I actually I can go further than this? Yeah, definitely. Um you just you you always look like starting out. The main thing you want to do is be a world champion, and that's that's if you don't have them them thoughts and dreams ahead, you're in in the wrong when in yeah. doing something wrong because that's where you set. You obviously got to be realistic, but all the time you're winning and, and winning titles and going up through the rankings, it's getting closer and closer. So yeah, that's always what you said, isn't it? Is kind mm. of setting a target up high, and you got yeah, to set your goals. I mean, I. I I didn't dare dream too big. I only ever dreamt of being a British champion. So it was never, so once I achieved that, it was very hard for me to reset my brain to yeah. want to achieve world. So although I got, when I got the world title shot, I believed that it was in my destiny to 
to become a world champion yeah. because of the way my career went. But obviously it wasn't to be. But it was very, it was a hard one. I remember actually winning the British and saying, "Wow, I've achieved," because I didn't dare dream when I was amateur that I could be anything more yeah. than a British champion. To me, that was a million miles away. Yeah. So then to fight for a world title was just way too far. But it's amazing how quickly you can get, get there. there. I yeah. mean, within four years, I'd, I was fighting for the heavyweight world title as a pro. So, I mean, that's massively quick, really, in, yeah. in terms of fighting for, for the for the world title. Yeah. In, yeah. You know, it's a massive thing, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. But it, it, was, it was. It was hard for me to reset my brain then to, to actually believe that I was going to become it. So, how about you? So, you won the British... Won the British and Commonwealth, yeah. Um, I, I went, was that one fight, British and Commonwealth? Yeah, yeah that was yeah. one fight, yeah. And then I went on to box for the European title in Spain, but I was unsuccessful. I lost that. Um, but before that, before that, I was I was uh, ranked really high with the WBO. Where I had the WBO European title, I got a really good ranking. Um, I defended that four or five times, so I got up to number three with the WBO. So I was rank, ranked three in the world and... Um, Manny Pacquiao just lost to Jeff Horn to, for his W oh, yeah. title. And um, it was meant to have a rematch, but Pacquiao um, didn't have the rematch. So he was looking for an opponent. And then I think the number one and two wasn't available. So I was next down and I agreed to fight. Everything signed, everything was agreed. And like to this day, I believe Jeff Horn like, just swerved the fight. Even his team yeah. didn't want the fight. Like, like I say, everything on my turn, like, yeah. side was agreed and signed for. And it, it, it was it was done. In my eyes, the fight was done. And yeah, they, they got cold feet and, and looked elsewhere and, and, yeah. and got another fight. So I, like, I always look back and think things happen for a reason. It wasn't yeah. meant to be, but that that I still to this day, I believe my style would have beat Jeff Horn. I would, yeah. have, I would have went on and beat him. Do you think that's what but, caused it to not happen? Mm, yeah, definitely. He, yeah. He, he was looking back for an easy run out. Do you know what I mean? He was looking for a get, get a win. Go yeah. to Australia, get a win, and then basically hold he, on to it. Yeah, get his yeah. belt, and then he had a massive fight with Terence Crawford. So, yeah, mm. I, I was all wrong for him, and and that's why I believe they got cold feet. Yeah, because you had a moment of uh, with the WBC, wasn't it? You had a opportunity to fight for the WBC, but wasn't in contract. Yeah, no. Nah, when <laughs> when I won the British and Commonwealth title, um, I was WBO European champion at the time. Yeah. And the, the, the boy I beat, Sam and he was WBC international champion at the time. But yeah, they were, they didn't put all the belts on the line. Like we, so you me and Sam, were obviously we're fighters, we would have wanted it. But yeah, I just, yeah. I just it didn't happen. So didn't happen. really, it I, wasn't it wasn't really in the ring. I am WBC yeah. international yeah. champion. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, unofficially, but, unofficially. Yeah, but yeah. Do you wish you could have like won that belt as well? Kind of. Yes, I love it's a lovely belt in boxing yeah. to have the, the green and gold belt is a, it's yeah, the one, it's a lovely it? belt to have. Um, but yeah, if it likes the one it. one thing everyone says is the belt. Obviously, you got yeah, it after absolutely. your career. Yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Go on. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, the belt means everything, right? Definitely. So the, yeah. you know, for me, the WBC was. It was that that was the one that obviously for me Mike Tyson and all, yeah. the, all the older guys they all had the WBC so it was although I was yeah you know, I, I think in '96 I was at, I was the um, I won the for being I think the best heavyweight in the WBO ratings at that that stage yeah. in '96 I got an award for that so that was nice I mean it's all whatever belt we we exactly. can fight for is yeah. great but. Yeah, definitely. So, like, do you do you have any boxers that kind of inspired you through your? I, I watched Prince Nazim. He was that my idol. Yeah. He was the main man for me. I used to watch him like all the the, the fancy stuff. Kind of grew and, up yeah. on him, and kind of like he was the one to follow. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I always used to say that anyone who'd listen, like, that's going to be me. I'm going to be like that one day. I'm, that's going to be me. Uh, like, literally, any time I'd be like, my mom would like make leopard print shorts for me and all that would be prancing around the house, shadow boxing and things like that. Yeah, he, like, even to this day, like, I look at him and think he's the man. Still the man. Yeah. How about yourself? Who inspired you during it? I think uh, my my career in the 80s, um, my amateur career, 
So I was 19. So Mike Tyson, I think, I think I had my first fight, 87. So Mike Tyson with one smashed his way through to the to the heavyweight championship in 86. So he was just, and everyone, I, I remember at that stage, everybody believed that he was like this alien that had been planted on the world because nobody could touch him and he was incredible and knocking everybody out. He had the physique at, what, what was he? 19, 20 19, years old. Yeah. So he had the physique. Everything looked absolutely perfect with him. Wasn't yeah. it? it was like he'd been sculptured out of rock yeah. and put on the earth. It was, uh, you know, it was an incredible thing to see. And for me, it was, he was smashing everybody. So it was like, we, we, we were getting reports. He's, he was knocking out 10 guys mm -hmm. in, in, in training camp yeah. and everything. So yeah, he was, he was the one for me as a heavyweight to kind of like try and not not try and be like, but that was the kind of dream to emulate something like him. So yeah. yeah. So what about like best place you boxed? Where was for uh, yourself? Where was the most memorable? Where do you remember the most? I remember um, I boxed in all, all like the main arenas in London and that. Um, what what stood out for me? I, I boxed at Royal Albert Hall as well, and uh, yeah, I, I went in the changing room and. Uh, you know, you see on TV and that, that, they have lights around the, the, the mirror and there was a fridge in there, a sofa <laughs> and a shower and all that. I, was, I looked and was like, oh, I've made it, that, yeah. I've made it sort of thing. But yeah, that, that was a good venue to box at. So that was kind of like where you were sitting yeah. there, you were like, this yeah, is it. felt like the man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what was, what was the best undercard you, you fought on? Uh, it's been a few. Mm. I boxed. Well, there's a story behind this one. I boxed on, uh, was supposed to box on James DeGaulle and George Grove on the card at O2. Yeah. And uh, it was like going to be like my third or fourth fight, but they put me as a live float. And uh, I remember I was changed up, changed, ready to go. It was on a live float. You you don't know when you're going to slot yeah. in. So you got to be there from early and, and you can get in any time. So if a fight goes early on the, on, on the TV, they'll put you in just to, Build up the time, so I was waiting, waiting, and it weren't weren't coming around. And Nathan Cleverly went in, and he was obviously going to be one before the main event. They said if he stops his guy in six, before six rounds, yeah. you're in. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, it's like my third full fight. O yeah. two is packed. Yeah. <laughs> there, everyone's waiting for the main event. I'm gonna, I'm like, it's, oh, I can't believe it. They've come in and was like, yeah, right, ready. So I'm hitting the pads, and then. Uh, time went and then yeah, like, no one else like you didn't get that knock on the door. Yeah. And then the, the the whip come in and said, Oh, that like, you're gonna be on after now. So I was a bit deflated and yeah. obviously that, that fight went ahead and it ran over at, after twelve o'clock. There was a curfew at the two you can't fight. So oh, I didn't really? actually end up fighting. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, there was a there's some dramas that night, but yeah. But you were there for the that night. Was a big, yeah, that was yeah. A, like a, going to be a big occasion. Was that like your introduction to the big venues as well? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was, it, that was a bit like to, to be a young pro and, and going to be fighting in an O2. That was massive, O2, massive, yeah. massive yeah. yeah. But yeah, but I've been on uh, loads of good undercards and that could, but that, that stood out to me. Yeah. Even I didn't box. <laughs> I, I, I boxed on the, um, on the undercard of Eubank Wharton in, uh, in Manchester. That was a big, big, that, that was like, I think it was 10, 12,000 people yeah. in the arena. And uh, that was a fight just before. So that was a great Quite experience. It, yeah. Boxed on the Tyson Holyfield card in MGM Grand. That yeah. was a good one as well. So, so I, know I was on a little bit earlier there, so I could enjoy the whole night afterwards. Yeah. So that was pretty amazing as well. Was that your best one or what was your best one? Uh, I'll say memorable. the experience. Uh, I boxed on Naz's undercard a couple of times as well. That was always a great, that was always great. Because you had some greats boxing back then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Kind of led the way for TV boxing. Yeah, you didn't know at the time, but they were, well, I suppose you did. You knew that they were great fighters. But, um, yeah, looking back, yeah, I mean, Naz, Naz was Naz was great fun. He was always a character. Would he come so, in and see everyone? Would he? Yeah, yeah, chatting? I mean, yeah. I mean, he, we always had a good relationship and um, have a bit of fun. He used to jump on and have a little wrestle with him at times. So, uh, yeah. It was a bit of fun. So. Oh, fantastic. So obviously gone through boxing careers, yeah. sort of, we're now heading for the future. Um, you obviously last boxed on December 2021. Yeah. Um, 
you've then kind of decided hang the gloves up. Yeah. What made you decide at that point? Uh, just the it's the way the, the fight ended really, and the, the controversy to, right around it, and the the way the boxing ball dealt with it. Um, yeah, it was 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 wrong. Do you know what I mean, it was it was, it was bad. Um, so yeah, I just I just wanted no part in like putting myself through that, that dedicating and sacrificing that a lot. Yeah. Uh, to 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 not get backed and put that like, as you're putting your life on the line. Yeah. Getting in there. Do you, do you think age played a bit in it as well? Kind of like looking at it. Yeah, but I I don't believe age is is not like people say about age and that. But I I was 33, 34, but I, that was my career best performance. I would say. So yeah. age age is nothing like when you sacrifice and put in the work. Um, yeah. To to people looking in, they're probably thinking, oh yeah, he's a bit old now to box. But like I say, that was my career best performance. So yeah. Um, to have it end like that, yeah, it yeah. was kind of kicking the teeth. And yeah, kind of... of course, yeah. And uh, yeah, like I say, I just think I just, the, the, the controversy. Did you did it. you decide it yourself, kind yeah. of, or did you talk yeah, to I, the others? Well, I boxed, and then obviously what happened happened, and um, I had a real good think. And then Kelbrook, I was training at the Ingle Gym, and Kelbrook was getting ready for the the calm fight, and uh, he asked if I'd go out to Fort Ventura to to on his training camp and and spar with him and train with him. So I was there, I was there for, for the month of January. So I was doing training obviously, and I was thinking about it. And then I had a good chat with Dom. And um, when I got home, it was, I remember what, what what made me decide. I watched the Jack Carroll and Josh Taylor fight. Yeah. And hands down, I believe Jack Carroll won the fight and there was no arguments about it. And the decision went the wrong way and went to, to Josh Taylor. and. Yeah. Again, the boxing board reviewed it and made a big thing of it, like that, like something was going to happen and they was going to do the right nothing, thing. Nothing happened. And nothing happened. They they accepted that decision and it's wrong. It's right and wrong and that was wrong once again. And it won't be the first and it won't be the last time, but it's wrong. Like, yeah. And I just thought, you know what? I, I, I don't want no part of it. Obviously, your last fight didn't finish how you wanted it to. Yeah. For those that don't know, kind of like what, what yeah. happened. But basically, I, I was fight, fighting a, a good kid, like a good young kid, up and coming kid, Hamza Shiraz, who, who, who's, who was flying and knocking everyone out. He's, he's the young champion. And they probably looked in, like saying, I'm, I'm old, like, you know, I'm at the back end of a career, trying to get a good name. And I, I went in there and absolutely scored him. Uh, it was a 10 round fight for his WBO European title. I scored him for, for, for the eight rounds. And then, um, listen, no thought of his own. I, I, I was rolling out on the ropes, got hit on the back of the head, and then I took a knee, which is fair enough. Like, it's boxing, you're going to get hit. He probably didn't intentionally hit me on the back of the head. So I took a knee thinking that I recover. Didn't have a count because obviously it was an illegal legal shot. And he then went on out of frustration because he's getting schooled to hit me three times, like big shots on the floor, which obviously put me over. Yeah. properly and then the referee Steve Gray just didn't handle the situation like he should have like his job what he should do he should have took control and fair enough he he, he told me I could take as long as I want but then promoters sitting there getting shouted that through the ring I can see what's going on telling me to get up and everything else and got a decision what I shouldn't have made to have to carry on when the referee he's broke the rules he should have been disqualified instantly which yeah. I believe if if it was the shoe was on the other foot and I'd done that to him, I'd have been straight out of the ring and disqualified. Before yeah. the fight, Steve Gray come into the changing room, speaks through the rules. And one of the rules he told me was, if you drop your opponent, go to the further neutral corner, do not hit him on the canvas. So that's the rules of boxing. Yeah. And the rules weren't abide Have by you so spoke to him since? No, there no? they, they was, they was obviously the big controversy after there was the board reviewed it and looked at it and got him in to give his account of things and just like I say that's right and wrong like he broke the rules he should have been disqualified I was yeah. I, and it, it wasn't like I was losing the fight and I'm chucking my toes out of the pram and thinking that I was schooling him uh, you couldn't give him a round I was well up on the scorecard and I got made to carry on when I wasn't in no fit state to carry on ended up getting stopped the next round so but listen it's, it's kind of now you're ready to move on yeah, exactly. and kind of like, grow your own chapter as well. Yeah, kind like of. I say, I'm not like people probably watching think I'm bitter. I'm not bitter, I'm just hurt by the way 
I've dedicated my whole life to boxing to get treated like that. Yeah. And there, there's there's rules for a reason, and you don't break the rules, and then, and then get get on to go on and and get success from that. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. just not, people looking in is not giving them the right view of, of boxing. If yeah. people, I still get messages to this day. People see it and think, how is that possible? People don't even know boxing. Look in and see that's wrong. You can't yeah. do that. How how tempted were you to carry on and kind of like go back to it? Yeah, I was. I was. There was talk of rematches and everything, but they make it sound like I swerved the rematch. I did not swerve a rematch. There was talk of it, but the, his manager come in the changing room and said uh, how shocking his performance was and the reason why making excuses saying that he needs to move up weight. He's too big for the weight and rare, rare and the, all the excuses under the sun. So that was on the night in my change room after. So in my head, I know he ain't having a rematch. He's moving up weight. I got told he's moving up weight because that's what so he's kind of because it was too light. Yeah. So it's fair enough. He's big for the weight. So yeah. when all this talk of rematches was going on and 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 happening, I knew in my head that he ain't gonna fight me at that same weight. So it's gonna be so at he's a gonna weight move that I'm up. Not You're exactly. gonna move on. He's well, gonna move on and kind of. So they they can say they offered rematches and this that and the other, but no way he was making. The, the 154 limit to fight me because then he further went on to move up and now he's campaigning at 160 at middleweight. So the rematch, they could say they've offered it and all that, but it was never going to happen at 154, which it should have done. So then you moved on to coaching? Yeah, yeah. Now you're coaching? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereabouts are you coaching out of? Where um, are you going? I'm, I'm now coaching at um, Falls Gym in Orpington, which is where I live. I live in Orpington. So, yes, yeah, nice and local for me. And, yeah, it's just, do you know what? I just... I, I I thought I want to still be round boxing. Like I'm not bit with boxing one bit. I love boxing. That's all I know. That's all I do. Um, so for me, I've experienced it from top to bottom. I've been round. The highs, the lows. Exactly. And for me, it's it's a new journey, and and I get excited. It's like I started from scratch again. And um, as a as a coach, for me, it's a it's a journey, and I get excited when I still around boxing, and I look at things how I coach. I the things where I've gone wrong and what should have done, what shouldn't have done. And the, 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 I can just pass on the knowledge and the experience that I've got. And like I say, I get a buzz from that because all my fighters, I, I want them to, to do better than me and go on to achieve better than me. And if I can pass one on what I know and my knowledge and get them there, it's, it's a buzz for me to be part of it. Yeah, because obviously both of you coaching now, obviously you've got a few more years coaching than... A just a few um but sort of like do you think that having your careers made you or making you and made you a better coach or do you think sort of like that sometimes it gets in the way a little bit sort of yeah no, what do you think you get people who say oh like if you don't box before you don't you can't coach and vice versa do you know what i mean but i just uh for me obviously i think it helps having that experience of actually getting in there i know my fighters, I know how they're feeling, making weight and Absolutely. training and they're tired and not they're having an off day. And I know all of that because I've been there and done it. And I'm not exactly, I can the talk to is, them. There's, there's, there's a, a lot of trainers out there now <clears throat> that haven't got the experience. Now yeah. people say that, you know, um, you don't need the experience to be a good coach. Yeah. I, I understand that. I, I, I think there is some great guys out there yeah. and girls that are working in the game, that haven't got the experience, and they're listening and learning their trade and doing doing well. Yeah. Dean Powell was a was a guy who started off um, at the lowest end of yeah. the boxing world and worked all his way up. And fantastic, fantastic guy. So he knew everything about boxing. Yeah. But still didn't know the actual inside workings of of what we've been through and exactly, things. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we we can give to the game which I believe we, we yeah. bring the extra little yeah. bit to the game. You, so. you can't beat that. Like having a conversation with your boxer, I know what they're saying because I've been there and done it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. someone who hasn't stepped foot in there may have to go and make weight and knows yeah. that feeling. They can't, they can't never, they would never. I mean, make, to make them weight for you would have been hard as well. What kind of weight did you have to drop? Yeah, I was pretty good when I was well weight. I used to obviously get down to the 147 limit, but I, I was, if I went to a stone, then that was enough, do you know what I mean? Right. But to cut 10 pounds was, was good for me. That, yeah. like, that's still a lot of weight to cut, do you know what I mean? But 
I, I always was done it right. I never, never did cut you corners. Do it, did you do the drying out or did you use the water? The yeah, water no, I never, I never, uh, it was only until I went to Sheffield and I done the, the water, but yeah, I used to, to dry, to dry out, out before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did that feel? Yeah, good. I, like I say, I always, I always made weight good. Uh, listen, it was always hard because it's, you're fighting that away that yeah, yeah. what's not natural but not that you had to do that <laughs> never had to do that in the 90s I remember me and Herbie Hyde used to share a house with a few of the Alan Levine and a few of the lads Danny Porter who was a flyweight and they used to we used to come in with a mug of coffee <laughs> and they had to drink their tea and coffee in an egg cup yeah. and we'd be sitting there going yeah, yeah. just sitting there sipping an egg cup of, of tea or yeah. coffee we yeah. were standing there with the, the thing <laughs> thought it was fun but Obviously, it would have been terrible to, yeah. and they would. I think they were losing like two and a half stone at the time. Mm, that kind of yeah. weight loss, which mm. was massive. Yeah. So they done exceptionally incredible, incredible. You, you still had to make weight though at the same time. I was Did a small. You? I was a small heavyweight. Herbie was a small heavyweight. We were we were walking around at 14s, 14. So you were kind times. of ready to go. When I when I fought as a heavyweight, I used to have to put weight on. So I mean, my I think my heaviest one one fight I weighed. I remember weighing in at 16.10. So my fight weight was around about 16.3 to 16.5. And one one day I'd weighed in at 16.10 the day before on a check weigh and I was shocked. And then I didn't eat for the next um, day and then just took the thing out. You had too much of a good time. 16.5 for the, I think <laughs> creatine was out there then. And I, I think they used to hold a lot more water. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember doing a thing on creatine, but but the weight had just gone up. That was yeah. near the end of my career. So, so how, how much weight did you used to put on? So from the one four seven kind of. Mm, I used to put on ten pounds. So I used to get. I used to weigh ten seven and get in about eleven three. Yeah. So yeah, about ten pounds. So sort of like through your kind of your experience now, sort of are you looking to go to grassroots or like amateur boxing or are you kind of. Pros, where do you want to go with your coaching? Yeah, pro, uh, professional. Yeah, I got yeah. obviously I got time for the amateurs and, and everything. I'm still close to Sid Khan down at the amateur gym in Nelson that yeah. I used to box for, and uh, I work with a few few of the boys coming through, and the amateurs. But yeah, pro pro boxing is pro boxing. Yeah. So obviously in the Hennessy yeah. camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. enjoying but, it. Yeah, really enjoying yeah. it. Yeah, um, obviously Chain Chain Michael and his sister Francesca do. Yeah, they're doing really well, and um, yeah, it was it was to. To get Michael was, um, it just it was just just happened. It was just like naturally. Um, he, he used to come to Fords for sparring, and uh, yeah, I watched him spar, and I helped out the boy who was, who was sparring. Alex was helping him out in the corner, and then yeah, it just it just developed naturally. Just really, into just, it. Uh, come come down for a few sessions, and he was fighting. I uh, had a fight like two three weeks, um, and uh, yeah, I just. I just said, oh, if you needed any help or anything, just uh, I'd help him out, and yeah, ended up doing his corner. He yeah, put on a really good performance, and yeah, from from then, just yes, gelled and worked together really well, and yeah, I'm really excited for the future. Oh, fantastic! So, sort of, obviously, it was different back when you turned into coaching <coughs> after you finished. Yeah, when I yeah, I spent 10, 15 years with the amateurs. I had a fantastic time taking them all up and down the country, fighting all the. When we when we uh, yeah when we fought um, so that, that that was great and that was great experience for me um, at the time as well I believe that that developed me as a coach as well so but but ultimately I think my first thing with the pros was in about two twelve when I worked with Dimitrenko in Germany so that was a, that was a nice introduction so I'd always I'd always trained pros but obviously I wasn't licensed so I couldn't. Go, I'd, I'd worked with Pelly Reed in, back in 201, 202 when I when I finished I had three fights with him and um, there was a few kids as well that I was working with yeah on, on the scene so I'd always been involved with the pros as well yeah. but didn't actually do and obviously now you got Tom yeah your yeah, son. yeah I mean Tom Tom's now and ten and I so. so talking about Hennessy sort of fought on a few Hennessy bills as well and absolutely kind of I mean. Yeah, Mick opened the doors for us on the on the first pro shows in lockdown, and um, and yeah, he's been uh, he's been there with, with us all the way. So yeah, good. yeah. So he comes down here quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes he comes down, down. And obviously yeah. we were down the yeah. week. So we, yeah, we've done. We've got a session here today after this, so yeah, it's good. 
Uh, excellent. So sort of talking about coaching, what coaches in the past have kind of, so obviously you've had a few coaches in your career and yeah. a few in yours, sort mm. of like any standout styles that kind of like you look to kind of put in yeah. and obviously what you have put in. So we'll start with yeah. Brad. I, I started my pro career with uh, Alan Smith at the Ibox gym in, in Bromley. And me and I are like, still now really good friends. We didn't, when I left and went to, to Sheffield and trained with Dom Ingle, uh, we were, like, I phoned out and so I just told, like, told him like, I needed a change. And like, we, we didn't fall out with nothing was bad. There weren't no bad vibes or nothing there. He, he wished me well. And like I say, I still go to his gym now to this day for sparring. And he, he listen, he's told me I can have keys to his gym and I can use his gym whenever I want. So it weren't like a, a like we didn't fall out bad terms or nothing. So his style of boxing obviously got me all the way to where I need where I was. Do you know what I mean? He, he took me. It was only the back end of my career I went to the Inwood gym, but um, yeah, like I say, I, I needed I needed a change. And for me, my style of fighting, I. I knew I would adapt to the Ingle, Ingle way. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they switch, they use the lines. And not that I was a big switch hitter, but, and people think this, they, they think if you go to the Ingle gym, they, they make you switch and they make you, but they don't, it's all natural. Up and down the lines on the circles, you'll see like the famous lines on the floor, but it's just a natural way of, of fighting. And like, you should be able to fight both ways. And yeah, that for me, that, that, that was the ice on the cake. Like I say, my last fight was my career best performance and it showed obviously just changing a few things and just, just naturally flowing. And that's, that's as a coach, that's, that's what I like. I just like, just, just hit and not be hit. Just relax that rhythm, that flow. Let the boxer fall into it Yeah, well. that's it. And I know everyone's not the same. Everyone's not got the same style. And I'll, I'll work with what, what they've got and just, just tweak things up and, but for me, you can't beat that, just staying relaxed and that flow and that rhythm. And that's always been me from, from the get-go. I like a good jab, everything comes from the jab and just the movement and, and, and that sort of style is for me. So obviously during your pro <coughs> career, how many coaches did you have? Just the two, just, just two. yeah, just Alan Smith and then Domingo. And an amateur, did you have just one? Just one, yes. Just it one way through. Yeah. So you kind of- Very long, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of quite, quite a, sort of like not many coaches nah. to kind of put you yeah. there. Yeah. Right. So what about you, Scott? I had three or four actually <laughs> doing the corners for me. Um, but I worked I worked quite, with quite a few. I spent every year in America of my career. Um, every year I'd go out there, work with a good guy in New York, in Gleason's gym called uh, Francis Romano, who was a very technically good trainer. Um, I worked with Howard Rainey, who, who was a who had Colin McMillan as a, took him to the world title. So he was a very technical trainer as well. Um, I worked with Steve Collins in Ireland. I worked with, when he retired, after he retired. Um, uh, Freddie King, back in the day, Alex Gower, worked with me um, at the start of my career. Ronnie Davis was with me since I was kind of 15, 16, or 16, 17 years old when I first come. Um, I actually walked into the gym down here. He was he was one of the guys. So I believe that they shape you know each each kind of trainer you work with. You understand them. You see them. Um, you know Jimmy McDonald was was probably the guy that changed my thoughts on a lot of the training stuff, on a lot of the the fitness based stuff. That was what I believe I was lacking in my career. I I think the technical side was what I had. Um, but the fitness side with the running and everything, we were, he's a very running based guy for fitness. And I, and I believe that that's me doing that running took me to the next level that I needed to get to. So after I got beat in America with James Ibola the first time, um, when I come back, I joined force with Jimmy. He explained all about the runs with me. You're he, he, basically a good boxer. He's a, kind of a middle distance runner. So if we're, we can we should be able to run hills and sprints and everything. So I think that that was a good mindset for me to get my my head around and understand, <clears throat> get myself running. I used to run my Herbie all the time, and a few of the lighter guys. And I could never I could never stay with them. And I used to think, oh, I'm fat and I'm lazy. I can't do this. I can't. I'm not, I haven't got the fitness. I'm never going to be able to run. And then I was explained that running. 
as long as you're doing the runs and you don't stop, you're getting the same out of it as everyone else who's lighter and faster. So that came from one of your coaches, right? So, yeah, that 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 come after a, a conversation with, with Jimmy, and then I understood the running, and I started not stopping on the runs, just worrying about me, letting everybody else run off, and I, I believe that. So would you say Jimmy was one of the people who kind of inspired you? Coaching wise, or yeah, I mean, your, they all yeah. they all inspired me. I took something from all of them: strength, um, technique side of it. I mean, Francis Romano, Howard Rainey was a, was a very uh, great man that I that I that I really loved working with. Um, they they were all great. They all had their at, at the time they were there. They all had their bits. Going to to Ireland, working with Steve Collins for eight weeks. Back in the day, he just retired as a world champion. You know seeing the mindset, understanding it. So yeah. it was a great one for, for mindset. Jim well. inspires Mick as well. He gives him some stretch. He's, yeah. he's a changed man. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting him out to it. He's a changed man. <laughs> so, like, obviously the two different eras, sort of like, I think America was quite prominent when you were boxing. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. is that why you went over there? Because obviously you stayed in, in England and yeah. in Britain, you kind of like you... You kind of stayed here, and because obviously at the moment British boxing is top of the game at the yeah. moment. So sort of British boxing was quite top then, but America had quite a pull. Ameri in it. America was the one. Well, that was a place. You had Tyson Holly Hollyfield, you had Lewis, you had um, Riddick Bow, you had well, you know in the heavyweight division, and plus you had all the other guys. I think the first day I walked into Gleason's gym, you had a you had a, um, a world champion from from a Dutch world champion. Black guy called um this is a thing with boxing, right? You can't remember the names. Uh, a great Dutch champion, lightweight. He was sparring Seb Judah. Yeah. I've never seen a spar to this day like it. Um, you know, when we spar, we can yeah. spin them around yeah. and like push their heads down and yeah. um have a bit of fun with them. Michael's so, getting that so today. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one so I think Sab had white head guard, white gloves, the other guy had green head guard, green gloves. And you the only you could only like, tell them apart by the hand speed and everything. I mean these guys were, were phenomenal. Um I get the Dutch guy. He was he was WBO world champion at the time, a lighter guy. And um really, really good great fighter. And and you could and, and Sab Judah was amateur. I think he was top Top amateur in the world at the time, and and the and the sparring, you couldn't tell yeah. the difference between who was who. So yeah. it was an amazing. That was the first day I ever walked in Gleason's gym. I remember walking up the stairs, breathing the air, and thinking, Tyson's yeah. trained here, yeah. Bo trains here, everyone's yeah, all the names, all the great names. I think when I walked in there, there was about three or four champions and ex-champs in there at the time. Um, yeah, really inspiring place. So you you went to America, you stayed in. Yeah. Was that probably because of the Team GB side? Do you think? Sort of. Yeah, do you think? Just or where, where, where just kind of you were doing yeah. well. You were yeah. just kind of you felt right just to stay and just kind of it. Yeah. Just flowed into. Don't it. get me wrong. I, I've trained like I would please. I went on a hol on a holiday. See when Scott's saying about the vibe and that in America, yeah. gym's different. You look cool in sparring camps, but they're actually holidays, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I've been away sparring <laughs> at different countries, but uh, just went Miami on a holiday. But obviously the famous Fifth Street gym. I walked in and seen Dino there, and he, he's called out, oh, like the champs in, and <laughs> that there was a few people sparring. I don't think there was any, like anyone big names or anything, but they were sparring, and literally they was. I walked through the gym, and they was queuing up, like telling me they do I want work, and that meaning obviously they're on the spa, thinking yeah. I'm alright, so I'm on holiday. Yeah. I've just come <laughs> to see the gym, but that's the vibe, like they just, they, they, they it's just different. Yeah, it was a tough, it was yeah. a tough world back in the nineties. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was. Knockouts after it was hard sparring all the time, isn't knockouts it? Knockouts after knockouts everywhere. Yeah. So everyone was the technical side wasn't wasn't in the in the in the game. I think that's probably why boxers are lasting a bit longer now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean the damage is is, is definitely less. We're in the twenty first century now, we understand way more, you know, we've we've been educated. I mean a lot more safety understand. features are coming in. But interesting, even even you know, you've got to put your life on the line yeah. in a ring. You you have to mindset is we do or die right we yeah. go out there and that's the mindset so, so i heard him mention it earlier so it is i mean every every fighter must understand that their life is on the line every time you get in the ring and that's 
I, I think the fans don't really understand that. That's you know they, they could be super critical over it. And they think oh this, but, but every single fighter who gets in that ring understands that this is could be the last time they get in here or get out. So you know. Well, he's, he's one of the most brutal kind of combat sports there is because it's stand up, get in. And well, it's headshot that's after it. headshot. Yeah. That's the thing. Even UFC and that, you know, you, you, you're, um, you're not concentrated on the head. So the thing with boxing it is all concentrated, mostly 90% of it to the head. And obviously when you get in the ring, they are the hardest rounds. Yeah. But how many rounds of sparring have you got to do to get to that point? Uh, uh, did you do much sparring when you were doing it? I did, but and my mindset changed when I went to Sheffield. This was we saying, Scott was saying, you pick things up from from different trainers and learn different. But uh, Sheffield, the Ingle Gym's known for not head sparring, body, sparring, body sparring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, when I first went up there, I was a bit in, ignorant to it. I was thinking, how am I going to get ready for a fight and not spar? But it soon changed me because we was doing like fifteen rounds body sparring, and I was knackered like halfway through I want to get out and it was good as open sparring and as a coach now that's listen you, you, you have I don't I don't I don't like a lot of sparring I don't I don't so I, I was I was told this back in the 90s of, uh, so I trained in Sheffield quite quite a lot through my career goes and forwards and, and they said one of the guys used to be an Ingle fighter and his career ended early because he because he got knocked out He'd been knocked out a few times, and he said to me one day, he said, Scott, I was like, why do they, why don't they do head sparring? Why wouldn't they? He said, Scott, you don't understand to learn that. You think about that style, right? So you think over the last, say, 25 years, how many of their fighters have actually made it? It seems like quite a lot, right? So you had the, um, uh, I mean, Naz, all, the, all them ones, Johnny Nelson, um, you had a handful of them back in the 90s. Yeah. And since then, Kel Brook and different ones, they've all come through and they're all top of their game. But what, what he didn't see was the 2,000 kids that were trying to learn that style yeah. that got knocked out. That's what I was told. So there was loads and loads of kids in that gym all trying to do that style. Everyone throwing headshots and everyone was getting knocked out. So that's why they changed it from the, from the headshots to body shots yeah. back in the day. So my, my take on it, I always look and think this is how, what I learned from it. And that's I was adding my twist. And I think, say, you're having a big title fight. You're having a, this a tough yeah. fight. Do you know what I mean? If you're fighting a champion, if you're vacant, whatever, it's a tough fight. So you say 10, 12 week training camp, <laughs> you're going to spar Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 10 to 12 weeks. And you're going to have a hard fight. That's to spar, yeah. not easy spar. You're, prepare, you're preparing for so, it. So, why are you going to have a fight every week, a tough fight three times a week, and then have a... Fight at the end. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. you just develop and you get... You, that's the main thing at the end, isn't it? Yeah. You want to win that fight. You want to be the best then. Train hard, fight easy, right? Mm -hmm. So then you're not going to have three fights a week and then yeah. for the main one at the end. So that's yeah. that's how I look on it. That's why I don't, I don't spar a lot. Yeah. What do you think about... I mean, I mean, listen, them fighters, all them fighters that we're talking about were fantastic. Yeah. And absolutely, I loved watching them. Exciting and everything. I loved the movement. I yeah. loved everything that they just, I mean, especially Naz. I mean, it was just, they they come around every 30, 30 years that them, mm. them people don't come yeah. through. He was an exception. Um, but what do you think on the handstand now in today's world? Ah. Uh, I, I don't mind it. I think if, if you if you listen, there's, there's times and a place where if you're in range, you're not gonna have your hands down. If you're out of range, distance and moving, that's the sort of style I I like. Just loose and that, that I spoke about before that rhythm and flow. If you're mid range there, mid range there, but as long as that head movement's off that center line and your reflexes and your timing strong, then sharp. Yeah. Like you, your hands don't that you don't need to be there. Like no, no. and shots can come from different angles and. You can flow a lot better with with your hands down. That's my take on it. I, yeah. I, if that's if that's that style, then outside yeah. we used to call it the kill zone. Yeah. With the circle around us. So where you stand in the middle, you got a circle around you. Yeah. Once that person comes into the kill zone, then, yeah. then the hands should be yeah. up. I mean, yeah. If if they're not up, then yeah. they should be up because yeah. that's obviously the kill zone, and that's where we get killed if we yeah. if we make them mistakes. So um, yeah. 
So obviously we're living in an exciting time at the moment, things are changing. We got a lot of female boxers coming through. It's the new exciting part of sort of like professional boxing, amateur boxing as well, really. Um, sort of obviously you're working with Fran. Yeah. Um sort of how do you feel that's going? Because we've got a growing like girls group in the gym. Um more and more coming through. You're now directly yeah. coaching. Yeah. Sort of like what's your kind of I, I, I believe women boxing is is biggest it's been like now than than it's ever been and like working with Fran is is amazing and that's why like my advice to Fran she's done unbelievable as an amateur but my advice to Fran now is to to, to strike while while the iron's hot and and, and turn over and, and while it's get, growing yeah, sort of exactly that and trust me I believe this and, and it's on here. She is like the future star of women boxing, like trust me, she's going to be a superstar in women's boxing. Well, we've seen her fight as well. Sort of, um, she represented the club a few times. You know, we're, yeah. we're excited for it as well. And whatever the future brings as yeah. well. And uh, it's going to be. Like, I mean, the the women are heading the bills more and more at the moment as well. Sort of. Exactly. We had that all women's bill the other the, um, the other month. There's, that there's, was... there's massive fights. I mean, the Kate. Uh, Taylor, yeah. Chantel Cameron, there's Savannah Marshall. That is, it's is a new massive. excitement. Isn't yeah. it? it's, it's brought a new excitement to it. I remember, I mean, I've been in, again, going back, we had one girl come in here and train with us years ago. I remember every guy in there's chest started puffing out, running, in, banging into each other, falling over on the run round, sparring, ripping each other's heads off in the spa because they want the show off. I, I, and I didn't believe it could work. You know, yeah. I thought, how are we going to? How, how can you have a load of girls in there? But now, I mean, we've got we've got them all in the gym. It's yeah. fantastic. Everyone looks after everyone. It's a it's a fantastic community as well, involving all the girls, and it's great to see. Fantastic to see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, covering all of that, what's next for me? Yeah. Well, got. Um, Obviously, coaching now, and I got a, uh, a young kid out, Robert Vinson. He's two and zero. He's he's boxing on on the weekend. Uh, another young kid coming through. He's waiting for, for his debut, John Dove. And uh, I got Michael. Michael, we're in camp now. We're uh, hopefully getting out in the next couple of months. And uh, yeah, like I say, we've had one together now, and looking forward to the future. And he's developing all the time. And yeah, I'm excited for his future. And like I say, we're working with Fran and yeah, excited for her future. Like I say, she's going to be the future star women boxing. So yeah, exciting times for me. I've got a small little camp and I'm happy with the ones I've got. And yeah, I'm just, like I say, I'm learning. I'm starting fresh to this coaching. So I'm, I'm learning all so the time. And it's a brand new journey. It's yeah, it's, it's exciting times. And yeah, yeah. the next, next few years are going to be really exciting. Well, it's fantastic. Up, man? Great to see you. Man. Yeah. Great to see you and great to hear. And it's great that you're back in the game. Yeah. So many good fighters are leaving the game as soon as their career's over. It seems like they take what they can get. And if they've been... I mean, you. it's, it's great that you haven't let that upset you no. and stay yeah. away from the game because yeah. you've proved that you're bigger than that and you yeah. can come back and yeah. you will have champions yeah. without a shadow of a doubt yeah. because um, of your experience. So, I, yeah. Like I said, I'll always be around boxing. I'm not... I'm not bitter with boxing. I'm just disappointed like, yeah. with the boxing board and just the way they, they handle things and that. Yeah. But I'll, I'll always be part of boxing. And like I say, I've got a new journey now. That yeah. that, that chapter's closed as a boxer right. and I can put that to new bed. New excitement. Like, and then I'm, yeah. I'm a coach now. So yeah, it's exciting times. Yeah, and yeah I'm, not, think, I'm not bitter. I'm just disappointed. Do you think it's be hard standing on the other side of the ropes? No, I, I still get that same buzz like... With, with, with the boys and people don't fighting. understand that when you yeah. when you take someone to the ring you're actually fighting with them yeah. so it's if if you're an ex fighter and you've never never been in a corner of somebody getting the same buzz we get when we walk to the ring and get in the ring we get when we take our fighter to the corner right Michael's last Is fight and I got in trouble with the ball <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was uh, got, got excited he was, he was like really going to town and like, doing really well and I'm like jumping up, like near enough getting in the ring, and the yeah. board inspector come round and tell me to sit back down. Calm down like, yeah, calm that's down. that. Yeah. So, so been, would you? It's like just the last little bit. Would you like encourage other boxers who maybe have stepped out of the game to kind of like come yeah. back in, coach if they want to, or do you think it's a personal? Uh, if they're there and having thoughts about it, then then why not? But if you get boxers not 
don't gonna put it's a, it's, it's a lot like I say the same sacrifice and dedication as a fighter I've got to give that now as a coach if not more because yeah. I've got people's careers in my hand yeah. so like I said that's what that's what people coaching probably wouldn't understand who's never boxed as well like they that, yeah, that dedication and sacrifice you've got you've got to give it to your fighter you can't so yeah if, if there's fight, ex-fighters who it's not a hobby like you've got to put your all into it remember yeah. that when you when you again people won't know this but when you fight that night you're lucky to get to sleep right if you nick an hour in the morning, you'll go to sleep about eight o'clock in the morning. Because you're just replaying over because and over again. Because your mind just... is just re- going through. So as a as a trainer, you stay awake till three, four o'clock as well. So we we live that with them. So we're on the you know the amount of times I'm I'm on the phone to my fighters at two, three, four in the morning because I know that they're they're wide awake, they're staring at the ceiling, they're rerunning everything in their heads going through. So yeah, most you know you have a lot of conversations in you know. I, I think I went through a stage where we just didn't sleep. We just stayed awake. It like like you'd stay awake all night because you were so fired up. You know. Is that just him or is that you as well? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but I'm fine, man. Yeah, it's great. You 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 had yeah. scanned that before, and making weight. So it's on. Yeah. <laughs> no, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming, Brad. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, and uh. Cheers, Scott, as well. Scott, Super don't player. forget my WBC belt, yeah? Hey, <laughs> we'll get it sorted, my man. We'll get it sorted. So, yeah. Yeah. Top man, thank you.